Hello, everyone. Um, today I'm going to present our work on the old birds that bond lens down there. It's a joint work um, by Dr. Manning and Ruth Rosalandi. So, one of the most important building blocks in cryptography is the block ciphers. However, the um, block size of the block cipher is a fixed number, and so which means with block ciphers we can only have fixed infinite encryption. And if we want to encrypt messages um, whose size is a multiple times of the block size n, we can apply the block cipher in so-called mode of operation. So to obtain the mode of operation, we apply the block ciphers iteratively. For example, the CBC mode. But the limit of the CBC mode is that the, um, this mode can only be applied to messages with then a multiple times of n. If we want to encrypt fractional data, we need to use um, so-called um, the padding method. So we first pad the um, message into a multiple times of the block size, then we can use the CBC mode of it. So the However, there is a disadvantage about the mm, padding method because there will be ciphertext expansion, namely that the resulting ciphertext will always be longer or larger than the um, original plain text. Mm. To avoid ciphertext expansion, we can, for example, use the counter mode Counter mode can encrypt arbitrary length bit strings. Um, but the disadvantage of the counter mode is that it turns a block cipher into a string cipher. So, which means sometimes it's not suitable for some applications. We can also use one of those non generic methods. Um, those methods retain the length of the plain text and make sure that the resulting ciphertext will have the same length as the original plain text. Mm. But those methods do not really extend the um, enciphering incipher, scheme into an encryption scheme for arbitrary message. So, the last method is ciphertext stealing. Mm. I'm going to explain ciphertext stealing on CBC mode. We first pass the ciphertext, uh, we first pass the plain text into a multiple times of n. Then we can apply the CBC mode. Then we need to truncate the ciphertext block CL minus 1. And the last step is swap the truncated ciphertext block with the last ciphertext block. So you can see that the ciphertext steering cannot be used uh, separately, which means it can only be used in combination with the other mode of operation. So it leads to a limitation of the ciphertext stealing that um, the, um, there will be an additional condition on the mode. It, um, it's required that the, um, each ciphertext block CEs need to be um, located independently of each other. So that's the reason why we want to have length numbers. And it can turn an n-bit enciphering scheme into an other encryption scheme that can encrypt every message um, with length n to 2n minus 1. So um, the first length doubler in the literature was XLS. It was proposed by Rissenhardt and Rajway in 2007. Um, it uses three block cipher calls and two absolute good mixing functions. However, it was broken by Nandy in 2014. The second one, DE, proposed by Nandy in 2009. And it used, but, but it's quite complex construction. You can see that it uses four different cryptographic primitive calls, 
where one block cycle call and one um, reach certain random function call and two hash function calls. So the last proposal is um, um, designed by Zhang in 2012. Um, it's also quite complex construction because it uses five cryptographic primitive calls, two block cycle calls and three hash function calls. And besides, it also uses an absolute good reason function. Um, note that the um, HK5, so the most left um, hash function, so it takes um, as input the length of the incomplete block. So this hash function can be calculated in advance. So um, if we look at the state of the art, we can see that every of those um, three length doublers, um, they, um, they at least need four cryptographic primitive calls. But um, in so our the recently introduced LDD length number it only uses two cryptographic primitive calls. So it compares favorable in terms of key length and um, the number of cryptographic primitive calls. That means if um, the dedicated uh, trickle block cipher such like uh, such as skinny. If those trickle block ciphers are used, then um, LDT will be the most efficient solution. So in general, as long as the two uh, as the sum of the two trickle block cipher evaluation from LDT is cheaper than the uh, sum of the primitive evaluations from um, DE and HEM. Besides, um, LDT uses a pure mixing function, which is a little bit more efficient than the absolute good mixing function. So now if we look very carefully at the security, we can see um, all, this, um, all those schemes only provide security up to the birthday bond. Um, except for the last one, LDT, um, the security bonds of the other constructions are proven to be tight. So now we have the question, can LDT achieve beyond the birthday bonds security? So maybe you will ask, why do we need beyond the birthday bonds length of words? So I'm going to explain to you two, um, two examples. The first one is format preserving encryption, and the second one is electronic product code tag encryption. Um, both cases are very similar, so I'm going, only going to explain the first one. So format preserving encryption considers the um, problem where the um, um, to encrypt the data for small domains that do not uh, does not fit in the standard block ciphers. For example, um, so. In practice, there's no length preserving way to encrypt an 80 bit string using 128 bits AES. Um, so, they do have standards FF1 and FF3 volumes, but currently, um, there's shown that um, those standards are not secure for small domains. So, we can also solve this problem with length numbers. Take the example of the 80-bit string. Um, the 80 -bit, this 80-bit string can be encrypted using a birthday box length number that's built on a 64-bit slightly screen size. Then we will have 32-bit security, which is really low. Uh, but if we apply a beyond the birthday bond length number to encrypt this 80 bit string then um, the resulting security the resulting security bond is 48 bit which is much better than the 32 bit so um, the main idea behind LPT construction is um, we want to build 
a more efficient and more secure construction. And um, this can be done by using the trickle block cipher and um, a single form of mixing function than the absolute good mixing function. So I think a little bit more explanation about the um, building blocks. Um, for trickle, um, a trickle block cipher is an extension of a conventional block cipher. So it gets an extra entry, the trick T, uh, which means for every different trick, we will get an independent permutation. So this gives more flexibility um, because the key from the cipher is a secret parameter while the trick T is public. So here are some examples um, of the triple block cybers that's designed in the previous years. The first one is LRW in crypto two, uh, 2002 and XEX in Asia Crypt 2004. And the last two are dedicated um, triple block cybers designed in um, Asia Crypt 2014 uh, in Turkey and Skinny in crypto 2016. Um, so, as mentioned before, XLS and HAND both use an absolute good mixing function where the um, mixing function gets better security if um, the epsilon is smaller. However, for our LTT construction, we do not need such strong form of um, mixing function. So, um, we can just use something we call the pure mixing function. Um, by the definition of an uh, epsilon good mixing function and pure mixing function, we can show that the epsilon good mixing functions are also pure mixing functions and pure mixing functions. But it's not always the same in the in first direction. And it's much easier to construct a pure mixing function than the absolute good mixing functions. So for um, our construction we only need the um, simplest form of, um, of um, epsilon good mixing function with epsilon equal to 1, uh, namely the swap function. So to formulate, uh, to formulate the security definition, um, I'm first going to explain the security game for a dead sampler. So at the beginning of the game, one of the two rules is chosen. The real world on the left side and the ideal world on the right side. So the adversary A gets a limited number of query access to the given oracle. Um, in the case that the given oracle is real, then when A enters a playtext, the given oracle will um, return the corresponding ciphertext. And conversely, when A enters the ciphertext, um, the given oracle will return the corresponding playlist. And if the given oracle is ideal, then for both cases, the, um, the given oracle will just return the event preserving permutation of the input. So um, we make sure that A never asks the same queries because um, with the same input, the both world will just return the, um, the same output, so this doesn't make any sense. So after the communicating with, uh, with the oracle, A needs to state which world it was given. If A cannot, then we can deduce that um, the given construction is a strong length preserving pseudo random permutation. So, um, the, ad the advantage of the adversary A increases if the number of um, the given queries Q increases. Uh, so um, this is a raw function that we are going to use to build our um, LTT construction. Uh, it uses one trickle block cipher call. You first pass the incomplete block M2 
into a bit stream of n bits and use this n bits bit stream as a trick input for the um, trigger block cipher to encrypt the first n bits of the message. Then uh, you use the swap function to swap the, lo uh, the, the last s bit of the output of the trigger block cipher with the, um, the incomplete block M2. So this route function in its own is not secure. But if we apply it um, twice after each other, then we get our um, LDT construction proposed in um, FSC paper, in our FSC paper. Uh, so in our FSC paper, we showed that um, we provide an uh, attack to prove the security upper bound of this construction. You can see uh, for the case of security upper bound, if S becomes larger, then um, this bound becomes the birthday bound. And for, we also prove the security lower bound, it's just a birthday bound, but in this work, um, we find new bound using um, the, a new definition of harmonic permutation primitives that I'm going to explain um, later in this presentation and the recently introduced um, chi squared method. So our new bond, um, for some cases, it gets beyond the birthday bond security. And Um, we also have um, three rounds LDT case. Um, if, so this, in this work, this is the first time that we have a look at the three rounds case. Um, same as before, we also um, prove the security of this um, three rounds LDT by using the combination of chi square methods and the harmonic permutation primitives. And we can see that um, the security of three rounds LDT is actually better than that of two rounds. And for some cases, we can even get optimal end bit security. So, in this slide, um, you can see the security of three rounds LDT. And the security of three rounds LDT is a function of the length of the incomplete block of the message. So let's denote the um, S by the length of the incomplete block and S by the um, length of the incomplete block of the shortest message and S max the length of the incomplete block of the uh, largest message. And you can see that uh, um, the security of three rounds LTT lies between um, when S max is equal to S min and um, when S max is equal to um, N plus S min divided by 2. So um, you can see we, we have much better security when S max is equal to S min. This is the case when um, the length of the incomplete block are all the same. And um, you can also see that the um, when the length of the incomplete block becomes larger, then we get higher security. So, um, in this graph, we compare the security of two rounds LTT with the uh, security of three rounds LTT. You can see that the security of two rounds LTT decreases with the uh, message length. While the security of three rounds LDT increases with the message length. And when um, the message length is near to 2n, then we get optimal n bit security, as shown in the slide. So uh, now I'm going to explain the harmonic permutation primitives that is a set uh, that is actually the most important thing of this uh, work. So, uh, in this work, we introduce and use uh, harmonic permutation primitives to improve our construction. 
So those primitives are marked by a form A and a form B. Um, a means the forward direction of the primitive, and B means the inverse direction. Um, both A and B can take the value of 0 or 1. Um, if it's equal to 0, then it means that uh, um, the output of this primitive is generated as a random permutation in the corresponding direction. If it's equal to 1, then it means that uh, the output is generated in a special way in the corresponding direction. Um, I'm going to explain that in the next slide, but you can see uh, by different combination of the um, A and B, we can get four different cases. The first case is that when A and B are both equal to zero, then um, both directions are generated as a random ideal uh, permutation. So it's actually an ideal primitive, so uh, not special at all. But for the other three cases, um, it's more interesting because at least one of the direction are generated using that special um, special technique. So in this slide, I'm going to explain how we can generate this um, this special bit through. Um, so in the case A or B is equal to one, then we first generate the last S bit universally at random. And then uh, we choose the first n minus s bits in such a way that the whole bit stream becomes an output of a permutation. Which means if the last s bit um, is a fresh value, then we can just choose the first n minus s bit totally at random. But if um, the last s bit already appeared before, which means if we have a collision in the last S bit, then we need to choose the first n minus S bit in such a way that the entire n bit stream never appeared before. So um, I'm going to explain how this primitive is used in to prove our construction. So um, I take I will take the example of three round LTT but the same technique can be used in, uh, for the two round case. So we want this to distinguish the three round LTT from ideal length preserving permutation. So the first step, we um, generate three length, um, ideal, length, um, ideal triple permutation and replace the uh, online triple block cybers by those three ideal triple permutations. And as mentioned before, um, um, harmonic primitives where A and B value are all equal to zero, those primitives are actually the ideal primitives. So which means we can again replace those um, three um, ideal triple permutations by harmonic primitives G00 and on the right side we can also replace the um, random length preserving permutation by this harmonic random length preserving permutation at G00 and um, in this step we can show that um, the security of our three rounds construction can be reduced to the security of those three um, security games, I would say. So, at the end, I will show that the security of our construction can be reduced to the security of harmonic um, permutation primitives. So, um, the first world, um, so the left side, the left world of the first um, distinguished scale is actually the uh, left world of our um, LTT construction with the ideal primitives. So we need to distinguish this um, three round LTT based on ideal permutations from three round LTT with um, three special 
um, harmonic uh, permutation primitives. The first primitive um, is G01, which means um, the forward direction of this primitive is generated in, in that special way, while the inverse direction is generated as a random permutation. And the second primitive, GL, uh, G11, this means that both the forward and the inverse direction generates the output in that special way that I mentioned before. And the last primitive is G10. Um, it generates outputs in the forward direction as a random ideal permutation, uh, while in the inverse direction it generates the output in that special way. Uh, so you can see that the both constructions are actually the same, except the underlying triples. So this um, this game can again be reduced in the following three security games. So where we are going to distinguish the uh, underlying primitive from the ideal version. So we want to distinguish the uh, three different cases of the harmonic triple permutations from, from random triple permutation. The second step, um, so the left road on the second step is actually the right road of the um, first step. So here we want to distinguish the uh, three round LTT based on those three different harmonic triple permutation primitives from um, harmonic length preserving primitives H11, which means that um, the both direction um, generates their input in in that special way I mentioned before. So, yeah, if you look very carefully at those two constructions, you can see the output generated by those two constructions are actually indistinguishable from each other, which means um, we can just ignore this part. We can just ignore the, uh, this step. So the distinguished, uh, uh, the distinguished advantage to this world is zero. So um, the last step, where we need to distinguish the um, harmonic length preserving permutation at um, H11, that's actually the right side of the second row. We need to distinguish this construction from um, the random idea length preserving permutation. So you can see. Uh, so the security of our three rows LPP can be reduced in those three rows, while the second row is indistinguishable. So we can ignore the second row, and the first row um, can be reduced to the um, security to distinguish the three um, hub, three special harmonic triple box and uh, triple permutations from random, which means the security of the whole. 3 round LTT can be reduced to security of harmonic primitives. So hereby we reduce uh, the security of our construction in security of harmonic primitives. So now the end of the presentation. Um, so in this work we um, introduce the new concept of harmonic primitives and we use those primitives to prove the um, jumped per second security of two rounds and three rounds LTT. And we showed that the three rounds LTT um, achieves, achieves better security than the two round version. And for some cases, it even gets optimal end security. So in the future, um, people can have a look at the um, Proof for the tight bond for two rounds and three rounds LT, LTT, and whether the three rounds LTT can get optimal security in general, and that's independent of the message link. And um, maybe it's also interesting to do some research about harmonic primitives 
to see if um, they can get tight bond for those primitives and um, well, whether those primitives can be used in uh, other constructions like um, the face of Cyrus or the sponge construction. So thank you for your attention. Have you implemented this? Have you implemented this construction? It looks like performance of the devil, right? I mean, for each cipher text block, you need to pass three. I mean, you have you need to pass through three block cipher calls. Three trickle block cipher calls. Um, yeah, but the most construction you will you will need multiple um, primitive calls. But you can also use the two round version of it. How do you actually compare to F F T? The one that so is for format preserving encryption that be standard for uh, in terms of efficiency? Uh, because you said that the standards are broken, which is No no no, uh, it's not broken, but it's broken for some for cases. Small, yeah, small, for small, small message, uh, but messages. So which you are actually uh, looking into. Yeah, so, um, so how is your comparison to that? Because they have 8, 10, 12 rounds of. The, the, they, yeah. they have a Python structure of so, 10 rounds. So how uh, do you compare? Yeah. First of all, uh, for small domain sizes, um, it's, it's broken. So at this moment, we don't really have a way to encrypt messages with uh, small domain sizes. While it can be used, um, while a lint can be used for this case. And in general, um, it depends on the building block of the lint So if you can find a very um, efficient lightweight block cipher, then the, um, the efficiency of um, this thing can be more efficient than the standard F F1 and FF3. But it just depends on which um, primitive that you are going to use. If you are going to use a well, totally not efficient one, then of course nothing will happen. But, yeah. So you so you introduced this new notion of harmonic yeah. like permutation. Yeah. Um, what's what's its what do you mean by a secure harmonic permutation? Because you don't actually define what you mean by security. This is what you would use uh, to, but you yeah. don't provide a. Yeah, actually, the, um, usually, if we say that um, this, yeah, the some something is secure if um, it's is indistinguishable from random okay. up to the birthday bond. Okay. And in this case. The random version is actually the harmonic primitives where a and b is equal to zero. So, yeah. um, so that means if um, so, those three are secure if um, each of those other three um, is indistinguishable from the first one okay. in the birthday bond. But it's um, harmonic primitives achieve beyond birthday bond security. Mm -hmm. But our security analysis is not tight, so probably we will need better analysis in the future. And do you have an example of a scheme that can implement uh, this construction, this primitive? Um, yeah. Actually, this is not something for implementation. It's just a theoretical idea that can be used to prove the security bond. Right. So, yeah, it's not a real construction. Okay. So. It's very nice as a generic building block because yeah. all, all the reductions you did in yeah, the game it? So. Uh, it shows that it allows for very easy reducibility so, which so means you might actually be able to have a bigger component and say okay indeed, we, indeed. when you reuse this indeed because um, so in this case the whole security of the construction this can be just reduced in the security of harmonic primitives. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a modular proof yeah. where um, as long as you, you prove the security of your uh, harmonic um, primitives, then you can use it for different, um, for different schemes. So yeah. that's the reason why I, I mentioned that uh, maybe the harmonic primitives can also be used for um, uh, sponge construction or something like that. 
So like if you if you if when you write out the theorem explicitly, yeah. what's your assumption on so you know you have your three LDT construction which is has three calls to the tweakable yeah. block cipher. What is your explicit assumption on the block cipher security? You mean the um, explicit assumption? Like you so you're saying is essentially your theorem would be something like if we assume that the tweakable block cipher is secure in some way, then the three LDT construction is also secure. Right? Uh, yeah. Um, so you're just assuming that it's a secure. No, those are the primitives. So um, it's a only you. Um, it's only it's only if you build a scheme on primitives, then you assume that the underlying primitives yeah. achieve some level of security. But those are. Those are primitives in their own, so there's actually no assumptions. But um, I do need to mention for primitives where the um, state size is equal to n, then there's one requirement that um, we cannot ask more than a certain amount of forward or inverse queries. But those are a little bit too theoretical, so. Um, I do advise you to read the paper. But, so how does the theorem statement look then? Um, the yeah, the theorem statement is it, it's really complicated because um, so you have a bond that consists of different uh, terms where it depends on the um, then the um, the um, so it's a, actually a bond that depends on the S minus S minus. So the the length of the incomplete block. You see that? But you say this is secure in that way because of ABC based on ABC. Yeah, okay, um, maybe it's easier to explain this. So suppose um, the I would say that's the the state size of, of these primitives is n plus s with s an um, element of 0 and 2n minus 1. So um, the security bound can be um, reduced to, to a term that depends on s max and S my and some data that's equal to the um, number of um, forwards and um, inverse queries. I did it. Yeah, actually a special number, but uh, it's too difficult to explain. It's, it's so this is actually a function of the number of forwards or inverse. Anyway, my question okay. was a bit different okay. about what is about, but I'm going to take it offline about okay. the theorem statement. Okay, then maybe, yeah. Not, not okay. yeah. From an implementation point of view, I mean, to me, this looks like a very expensive way to save at most 127 bits of ciphertext. I mean, are there any other reasons why I would use one of these line doubling schemes? Uh, how do you want to encrypt uh, 80 bits stream? Sorry? If, if you get an 80 bits stream, how, 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 how do you want to encrypt it? If you want to preserve the format. You want to do, you want that after your encryption, the uh, ciphertext has the same length as the original plaintext. It's like credit card data shuffling. And you want to keep the format, you want to encrypt it. Okay. You don't want to expand, you just want to keep it in a database. You can afford actually expensive computation. So I think at you this can do it offline. Yeah, at this moment, this is the only way at the um, FF1 and, and FF3. But of course, FF1 and FF3 is already broken for small domains. So for small domains, at this moment, this is the only way to do that. But um, yeah, the three round case is interesting because, um, like mentioned in this slide, so. When the bit stream is really small, then um, only the three round case gives you a 
a good security vault, I would say. Because otherwise, if you use a 64 bit lightweight block cipher, you can only have 23, uh, 32 bit security. That's, that's not enough. For a three round case, then it will be better, I would say. Thanks. So, any other questions? Thank you for your attention.